welcome to the second in our series of Take a Pew. My name is Lorna Hood and I'm outside the Parliament building here in Edinburgh. Taking a pew with me are our guests Ruth Davidson, who is leader of the Scottish Conservative Party, Andrew McPherson, who is the moderator designate of the Church of Scotland National Youth Assembly, and businessman Alan Thornborough. We're going to continue the discussion from the first Take a Pew video. Outside the Scottish Parliament, which has been here for 17 years and has seen many, many changes, as has Scotland itself. Has the church kept up with those changes? Does it have to change? Does it have to move with the times? Let's ask our Take a Pew guests. Ruth. Hi, Laura. I think um, there have been a lot of changes within the church, but I, I'm not sure if it has quite kept up with the pace of change in the, the country at large. Um, I think some of the issues that the church is discussing right now are, are have been long in the making, uh, declining membership, uh, you know, the large number of vacancies in terms of uh, in terms of ministers, the small number of people that are going through training, uh, and some of the issues regarding the estate of the church, the, the buildings and things. And I, I don't think you can tackle them all at once, but um, I would suggest that there are ways in which you can look at individual areas and improve those that will have a knock-on effect to the rest of the church. Okay. Alan? Um, well, I have a slightly different perspective. I'm much newer to the church, so uh, I was only ordained last year. Um, and the church was, funnily enough for me, the last place I looked for meaning and purpose. So I don't know if that says something about the role of the church, uh, or maybe it was just my own experience, but what I have found is a very welcoming uh, family, actually, and a lot of people actually out meaningfully making a difference in uh, society and the things that affect us all. So I think that, as Ruth mentioned, there's a lot of big issues on the yeah. table, but a lot of really positive things underway as well. Yeah. Andrew, you, you're the young person here. Um, How do you see the church? There has been, I suppose there's quite a mix, because in a lot of topics, the church has perhaps struggled to keep up. But in some other areas, it really has taken a lead and been on some of the first steps of things. If we look at, for example, its response to the refugee crisis yeah. that's mm -hmm. been going on, the church has really been quite adamant in its position and what it takes on and really trying to make a difference for the refugees that are coming from all over the world. Um, and there's many other issues as well. For example, climate change. We had people representing the church at the Paris summit last year um, and really taking a forefront from the Church of Scotland as to what we should be doing to tackle these issues of climate justice in our world. So it has really kept up in some issues, whereas others it has struggled to some extent. Ruth, you, you brought back a kind of revolution within you, you, the Tory party in, in Scotland and now lead the opposition. What would you say should be the thing that the church should tackle in order to bring about, if you like, a revolution within the church? I, I wouldn't ever try and compare ourselves. Uh, no, I don't think we would want you <laughs> to do that anyway. Church would want that either. No, no, that. But, um, if I was to do one thing yeah. with the Church of Scotland, I would target the 16 to 30 year olds because I think that while there are a lot of churches that do quite well in terms of um, you know, Sunday schools and Bible classes, actually that's where the drop off really, really starts. And that also helps address things like the training of new ministers, because a lot of people get their calling in within that age group. It helps if you can keep people and challenge people within that age group within the church, then it keeps the pews full. It helps young families come forward as, as people within those age groups age themselves and bring families in. And I think that you should look at things that work. It, it's not all about dumbing down. Sometimes it's about being more challenging. So. I know it's controversial, but one of the big success stories in Christianity in Britain in the last sort of 20 years has been something like the Alpha Course, which has set out to talk about how uh, people relate to themselves. And in a, a Facebook, Twitter world, people are always thinking about themselves, but also how faith and challenge can be part of finding out more about yourself. And it has brought people to the mm. church as well. So if I was the church and I had a five year plan, I would take on one aspect that had lots of knock on aspects and I would make sure that we brought in organisations that work well with that age group, so things like the Prince's Trust, things like some of the Outward Bounds courses, lots of things like that, bring them in to help with the church, engage that age group, and then keep them within your family as you move forward and see the church grow that way. Yeah, Ruth, you, you've been part of the church really all your life. You know, you <laughs> yeah. were yeah, taken there as a baby and yeah, still right the within up. the church. But, Alan, I think you've come later yeah, to much the church. Yeah, much cough thirties, uh, just about. So I think for me, uh, that's quite a crucial age, actually. There's an earlier point in your life where you seem to be 
uh, doing a lot more striving and trying to build career and these sorts of things. But there comes a point, I think, where you're looking much more broadly at what's the kind of bigger issues in society, what's your role within that, is there a purpose to what you do day to day, and how does all of that marry up? And I think the church offers a place where we can have those conversations and reminds us what it means, first of all, to be human, never mind Christian, uh, and how we can perhaps work together. Yeah. Uh, how did you come to the church then? Uh, really asking some of these questions of myself and I actually uh, had a family illness at the time which prompted uh, you know a lot of turmoil and I knocked on the door of my local church and it was no more difficult than that. I found a very warm welcome uh, in both uh, some of the elders there and my local minister and uh, some time later I ended up as session clerk. <laughs> <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't daft. Oh my God. Andrew, you um, are going to be taking over as moderator of the National Youth Assembly. Um, we have a great bunch of, of young people there and sometimes we portray the church as, as not having any young people at all, yet you know yeah, that that's not the case. It's very true and Ruth touched on it as well. Is it's an age where we really need to start getting people involved more in the church. We've seen it in recent years with younger people getting a vote in the Scottish Parliament mm. um, and also we now have our youngest ever MSP um, and it should be a way that the church should be following as well and getting more younger people involved in the decision making of the church. Not necessarily just at a national level where we already attend the General Assembly as youth delegates but also at a local level in our own congregations if we had more younger people as elders on our Kirk sessions making the decisions of the church at a local level I think it could have a great impact for the church. Young people would feel more valued in their role as well. The church is involved in the things that society are involved in. You know, we are involved in all the major discussions that are going on. So why is the church such a turn-off to so many people? Why are we struggling when we do talk about the things that people are involved in in ordinary everyday life? Is it something to do with worship on a Sunday morning? Is worship not relevant to normal everyday life? I'm not sure. I'm. I can only speak for myself and look at the sort of circle of friends and things that I'm around. They're saying, you know, what what are you, what is it that you see? And I see so much good within the church, but I don't know if it's the, you know, the religion aspect of that or or whatever that people find some difficulty with. Um, I can only tell you from my own perspective the really positive impact it's had on me and on you know the way I think and the way you know I look at some of the matters that really count. Andrew, what do you think about church worship? Do you think it's something that has to change? For every person that you find that wants it to change, you'll find someone else that doesn't. Yeah. It's a difficult topic. Yeah. Um, and for a lot of people, myself included, I, I do enjoy a Sunday morning service. There's always something that you can take from it, whether it's something small or something big, there's always something to take for, from it. And being able to worship with other people is a, a strong part in what really grows people in their faith. We see at the youth assembly, a slightly different form of worship from time to time and it's also very different than that it's a time when a lot of young people can worship together for a lot of young people they might not worship together very often in their own congregations mm -hmm. there might be very few of them um, and to come together in a big group and worship as one as young people can be very powerful for the young people do you think perhaps that we don't trust young people enough trust you know, is a, it's a difficult <laughs> word yeah um, and we do see examples where that could, that could be the case, and I would love for it not to be, mm -hmm. and for young people to really be able to just stand up a couple of times a year and for the young people mm -hmm. in each church to leave the service instead of the minister or the yeah. guild or any of the elders. Certainly growing up in my church, we used to get to be allowed to be sort of the Sunday school or the Bible class, we'd lead the service quite often. Uh, and some of the older members of the, com the um, communion, uh, community uh, would love it. You know, they, they, they wanted us to do more of that. And I'm yeah. pretty sure that the, uh, the minister quite liked it too, because they, they didn't have to write a service that night. Well, that's right, absolutely. But, um, <laughs> so I, I think that's one way of doing it. Um, but I think it's also not just about having, you know, twice a year, the young people lead the service. I think it's about integrating the young people into the decision making of the church. I think it's about making sure that the outreach happens in a peer to peer way, as well as just having a, a single point of contact. And I think one of my issues with the Church of Scotland and the way that it's structured is that your minister and then your, your session um, are pretty much chief cook and bottle washer for everything. And actually, in some communities, you maybe need um, kind of regional help in terms of not, not doing everything for that church, but helping them and setting the path for them on how they would do an outreach yeah. work or how they do other things. 
the problem, of course, now is that we don't always have a minister in every community. Mm. You know, when I moved to, to Renfrew 37 years ago, we actually had four churches of Scotland. Renfrew was um, about probably half to two thirds the size it is now, and now we have two churches of Scotland. Is that because you went there, or? <laughs> <laughs> It could have something to do with it. It may have something to do with it. So, so we now just have the two. Yeah. So how do you, you become the parish minister yeah. of such a mm. huge, large parish? And to be fair, Church of Scotland realise that and, and they're looking at that and they're now talking about um, hub ministries mm -hmm. yeah. where there'll be um, one minister who have responsibility, but people in the various churches round about won't be ordained ministers. They may be locally ordained ministers, mm -hmm. uh, they may be elders, they may be readers, but maybe, just maybe, this decline in the number of ministers is giving the opportunity to other people in the congregations, mm. you know, two elders, two lay readers, yeah. two locally ordained people, and not just, you know, this person six feet above contradiction. The reason that the church is, is choosing to move to that model in some ways is because there aren't enough ministers. It's yeah. not the, that's not the model that they would ordinarily choose. And I think that there is a role for people who want to You don't think God is maybe telling us something, though? Well, possibly. Possibly. You know? um, but I, I think that instead of using that as a way to manage decline, actually you should be looking at ways in which you can come back. And there are yeah. not just other faiths within Scotland that are growing, but there are also other Christian churches within Scotland that are growing mm -hmm. uh, and in other parts of, of Western countries. So the decline is not inevitable. And I think that there's ways in which you can look at repopulating the pews and then you start to look at ways in, in which you, you then encourage more people to choose ministry or they feel that they have the calling to choose it themselves and dedicate themselves to that. But it's but getting outreach work, getting support work, getting meaningful activity within churches is not just the role of a minister. Yeah. And there are ways in which the church, yeah. as in the Church of Scotland, can support that sort of work and allow the minister to carry on with their ministry and the elders to do the kind of pastoral care that churches should be doing every day. Yeah, I think that's very true. And we've certainly been trying to, to develop that uh, over the years. What do you think? the church should be involved in. I mean, you said, Alan, that um, you, you were agreeing with Ruth at one stage mm. when she said her faith just wasn't about worship on a Sunday. No, um, it's not. It's been out. I mean, for me, actually, my experience is not so much in on a Sunday. It's more out actually in our community. It seems to me, if I'm concerned about injustice or fairness or whatever else, then I have a duty to go and, you know, be involved in, you know, changing that. And that's a very, uh, you know, possible thing to do in a local church community, as far as I can see. We've a food bank, we've got, you know, quite a lot of involvement with refugee aid and all sorts of different things. Great collaboration with local council, uh, and it isn't just our minister, it's all kinds of people who feel strongly about whatever the subject might be that are standing up and being counted for. And I think that's a very, very powerful part of the church that, uh, you know, whether it's put upon us or otherwise, mm. that's a good development in terms of, you know, who's out in sort of the face of the church and representing it. And who's doing it. When mm -hmm. we were setting up here, someone passed and asked what we were doing. You said it was, oh, it was a video and they said, oh, is the Church of Scotland going to be involved in politics then? Mm. <laughs> um, so, you know, what is your attitude to that? Particularly, Ruth, <laughs> how does politics and your faith work together? Well, I, I think, first of all, the Church of Scotland is born out of politics. You know, we don't have to go back to kind of how it was created, but I, I think it has always had a, a role to play within it. Um, I think at a, a national level, I mean, personally, for my own part, I think that um, while being a, a Presbyterian and not looking at sort of hierarchical structures, like for example in the Roman Catholic Church, if you're going to have a moderator, you've got to leave them long enough in the job that they've learned the job by the time, you know, uh, to be what able to implying? use it before what they go. Yeah. Uh, personally, I would, I would double the length of the term. I don't think it should be a one-year term because I think in the moderators that I've met in the job that I've been in, they're kind of only getting a handle on it and feeling comfortable in it at the point they're being asked to leave. But also actually, and particularly in, in rural communities in Scotland, uh, the church being the focal point for that community. Uh, and in so many rural communities in Scotland, people feel like they've lost their post office, they've lost their village shop, they've lost their village school. The church is the only thing that they have left. And it's about opening your doors and allowing all of that community to feel welcome in the church in whatever capacity. Now, a lot of that won't be worship on a Sunday. A lot of that will be people who choose not to come and worship on a Sunday. But the leadership within the community allows them to come and have their bridge club or have their flower arranging class or, or all of these other things that can be community use, but still nourish a community. And that comes centrally from the church and from its, its, its giving and, and its ability to host people.
Do we have faith in the future of the church? I yes. Do. I yeah. do. You Absolutely. do? Yeah. We all do. Yeah. So I think there's a huge number of really good people working hard. Uh, and I think that there is a need within Scotland to have that sort of nourishment. And I think that the, the church wants to provide it. And I have absolute faith that the church will continue. And the very fact that we're doing this to look at ways in which the church can, can make the most of itself shows that the church is aware of that yeah. too. Good. So we will finish on that very <laughs> positive note. So thank you to my guests who have joined me in this pew, Alan and Ruth and Andrew. And it's goodbye from the Scottish Parliament here in Edinburgh. And you can watch this video in tomorrowscalling.org.